Dr. Adam Asoyan, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, very excited to be speaking with you. Well, I'm excited to be speaking with you as well. And, you know, I've, I've kind of uh, billed the show as being about uh, uh, sex offenders and your work with them. And mm -hmm. uh, while I'm very interested in that, I'm also very interested in you as a pretty newly minted uh, doctor. Side yes. Uh, yeah, how, so I did. How, new, how newly minted are you? When did you get your degree? So I graduated. I want to make sure I should know this off the top of my head. I have my diplomas right here. But <laughs> um, I graduated in 2018, became licensed this past year, uh, just not even within the last six months, I became a licensed psychologist in Pennsylvania. Okay, so you truly are newly minted because, oh, 28, I was thinking, I lost track of time. I was going to say we're in 2018 now. No. No, not quite. Almost 2019. <laughs> yeah, we're in 2019, and we're moving very quickly into 2020. So Yes. You, um, so what drew you into having an interest in psychotherapy? And I'm wondering... You know, I'm wondering, uh, what were you like as a kid? Do we see sure. anything in your early years that would foreshadow this career? Yes. <laughs> um, so I think every therapist has their personal story. For me, um, I'm very lucky. I've known exactly what I wanted to do since I was 14. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's rare. Uh, my favorite, One of my favorite stories growing up, I would tell my grandfather, Oh, like, okay, I know what I want to do. And he's like, Adam, you're young, you're going to change your mind. That's fine. Like, you'll figure it out. Lo and behold, I haven't changed my mind a single time. What did you tell him you wanted to do? I didn't know that, like, what a therapist was, but I told him I wanted to, like, talk to people and help people. Um, I had gone to a therapist when I was about 14 or 15 after my parents divorced. Wow. Um, they put my brother, sister, and I all in like our own therapies. And I absolutely hated my experience. Uh, you hated your therapy experience? Oh, it was awful. I remember he sat me down in front of a TV that he had in his office and I played video games. Um, and he would be sitting at his desk. Now it wasn't every time, but it was enough for me to remember and feeling like this is just a waste. Really? So, yeah. so you have a sense, a sense that you should be there talking about your emotions and what had just happened in your life? Right. And look, I'm sure being a 14 year old, I was like, no, I'm fine. I don't need, I don't have anything to talk about. Okay. Uh, yeah. But nevertheless, you know, I, I work with adolescents. The amount of times they tell me I'm fine, I have nothing to talk about. And then I do like little poking and prodding and it all like word vomits out. Yeah. Um, so after that experience, I didn't go for long, but I very distinctly remember wanting to be a better experience for kids going through something similar. Uh -huh. So very early on, I knew I wanted to be essentially what I learned later to be a psychologist. Um, and I wanted to work with adolescents going through parental divorce is what it started out as, um, very niche. And then as I went on, gained more experience, more education, the scope of who I wanted to work with obviously broadened. Um, although working with adolescents, young adults are by far my favorite population to work with. Yeah, well, that's great. There's certainly a huge need for that. and. Uh... There is, especially from at least what I've been told and what I've seen by male providers. Um, there really, there doesn't seem to be a lot of male psychologists, at least in my area, that want to work with adolescents and young adults. Um, I mean, adolescents, there, not many people want to work with them in general. They, huh. they prove to be pretty difficult. Yeah. But uh, I love it. Yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> and the fact that you love it uh, probably predicts that you'll be very good at it and, and very successful. 
Thank you. I hope so. That's yeah. the goal. Yeah, I think so because you know uh, they're going to respond to that. I'm I'm sure. And since there aren't that many people competing with you to do that work, uh, I think you will uh, find that you can become a referral source. Uh, yeah, that is absolutely. somebody that people will refer to. And, and if you're not already doing it, I would advise you to kind of put that out to your local psychology community, medical community, mm -hmm. uh, court community, you know, Oh that, yeah, I'm all, I'm all over those. They, oh, good. I send all the emails and phone calls as much as I ethically can. <laughs> um, I also, one of my selling points, I mean, well, you mentioned it earlier, like I'm a newly minted psychologist. I turned 29 last month. Okay. Um, and I personally, I don't shy away from my age. I view it as a selling point of myself. It's too that's, often. That's great. Kids, yeah. Too often younger adults and adolescents, they're paired with therapists that their parents find. And they tend to be older, more experienced. Um, and the kids can't connect with them. Yeah, they don't relate to them, and then I talk to these parents. I'm like, listen, you're bringing your kids to people that don't know what Instagram is or Facebook or Snapchat. They don't understand what a meme is. Um, I am able to relate to them, and they seem so far to respond really well to talking with someone that they feel is more aligned with their generation, with their age and interests. That's, that's so great. That's a great attitude. I was about your age. I think I was 30 when I got my, uh, my doctoral degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, it always seemed like I was uh, too young to be, uh, and partly that was my graduate program back in those days, and it was very psychoanalytic. And they had the attitude that, well, you have to have a lot of gray hair before you do any kind of private practice. And uh, so I yeah. had that message really strongly in my brain. And uh, the, the period of being in the sweet spot, I, I'm not even sure when it was, it's very short. <laughs> Because it's a very a small window. Time, I was I was too young, <laughs> and then right. then you're too old. So uh, that is the that's the message that I think is portrayed by a lot of different institutions. Uh -huh. That private practice is one. I've heard private practice isn't where the money is. Um, private, yeah. Uh, private practice, you know, you need to have a following before you open a private practice. Uh -huh. um, and that it's something you do later on in your career. That's kind of the message I got way back right. when. I'm surprised that that's still being put out there because it really opened up when um, master's level practitioners happened uh, you know for a long time yeah. mass people with a master's that was just a step on the way to a phd and there was no right. side d right. and uh, so that was very much the message and the feeling was well the ability for people at a master's level uh, to practice that's just going to blow the doors off and it's going to yeah. put everybody else out of business who went for those advanced degrees mm -hmm. But uh, it was a it was a struggle even for myself deciding to go for the doctorate instead of stay at the master's level because most of what I do I'm able to do with a master's. Yeah. Um, the the real differentiation is psychological testing and not having barriers with that, as well as frankly the prestige of right. the title. I think and the weight that that. that carries. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into it in a bit, I'm sure, when we talk about my work with sex offenders, but going to court and testifying, you know, being able to be a doctor on the stand testifying wow. holds a lot more weight as yes. a master's level clinician. Not that their insight would be any less valid, but when we talk purely from, um, you know, face value. Yeah it certainly helps when talking with attorneys and judges and court masters, especially as a younger uh, professional. Oh, I can believe that. I'm curious, you were told uh, that private practice wasn't where the money was. Yeah. Where were you told the money is? <laughs> no, Couldn't nobody, tell you. 
Did they just um, say that it's, there's no money here? <laughs> I really wish I knew where they thought it was. So a lot of it was from college and graduate school professors that were obviously in academia. And a lot of them had private practices on the side or worked at a private practice on the side a couple yeah. hours a week. And look, I can see where they're coming from um, being, like, if they went through purely insurance, seeing four or five clients a week that like, you're being reimbursed by the insurance companies, you're not making any significant money there. Right. Um, especially with some of the rates. Right. But if you're full time, and whether you're full time with the insurances or out of pocket, there's certainly. You can you make, can a, make decent, a really good living. You can make a very decent living if you're, if you really enjoy the work and put yourself into it. And I think that's yeah. really key. Yeah. And I'm, I was very grateful. Back in grad school, one of my practicum sites was a private practice, which I know is very rare. Not yeah. a lot of private practices open up for practicum students. Um, and he took literally every insurance under the sun. If yeah. someone called up and said, I have this insurance and they didn't take it, they got paneled. So that way they were able to take everything. So I was reimbursed anywhere from literally $8 for a session all the way to like 130 yeah for the same service yeah and then i'm i've also worked where at a private practice where it was largely out of pocket so i was able to see both sides of it and everything that went into that which certainly yeah. has helped me for yeah. my own practice now remind me where you got your uh your id from marywood university in scranton pennsylvania okay Okay. Yeah. So, so would that be like a freestanding graduate school? There are a lot of those kinds of schools around. No, no. So um, Marywood University is, um, it's, I don't know when it formed, but it's a longstanding university. Okay. They offer a lot of different programs, a couple different, I think two doctorate tracks. PsyD is one of them. Um, it's certainly not like one of the Argosies or something like that. Yeah, that's it's not a professional I, school. Yeah, right. That's what yeah. I was wondering. Yeah, right. No, it's not a professional school. It's a full fledged university and uh, they do undergrad, graduate, all of that. Yeah. Well, let's get into the uh, the headline topic here, uh, which you've already touched on a little bit, which is your work with um, with sex offenders. Um, how did that come about? So I, for a long time, I've been interested in forensic work. I didn't know what in the forensic field, but I really always thought testifying would be awesome. Um, <laughs> really? it, would be a, it would be a lot of fun. Um, I'd never done it in grad school, obviously, but someone I consider to be like a surrogate uncle to me. It's my father's best friend. I was best friends with his son growing up. He's a forensic psychiatrist in uh -huh. New York. So I grew up hearing all of these stories and him testifying and all that. I was like, that just seems fascinating. So in grad school, I was very fortunate and had an opportunity to uh, have a practicum experience over the summer working at a, uh, psychiatric hospital that houses civilly committed sexually violent predators. So civilly committed means that they've already served their sentence, but the state then decides you're still not um, reformed, I guess they would say. You're not ready to, to go out and be in society. Wow. So they house them indefinitely. Uh, and then that's where they stay. And they, it's a pretty intensive treatment. Um, and because of the nature of their crimes being sexually violent predators, that they're all housed in one special unit outside of the general population um, so that there aren't interactions. So I did that for a summer where I sat in and co-facilitated some groups. And then I also did some um, cognitive assessments on some of the inmates there. So they really threw you into the deep end of the pool 
uh, but also it sounds like you craved <laughs> being in the deep yeah. end of the pool. Yeah, I mean, they had a, it was great. They had a lot of structure around, like I had a lot of support through that process. Um, but yeah, it <laughs> dove right into it. And it was, that was my first experience in a forensic setting. Um, and my first experience working with that specific population of sex offenders. Um, from there, you know, I, I kept with that interest and really thought it was a very uh, fascinating population to work with, trying to figure out what not just the motives were, but their rationalizations. I mean, these are some of the most manipulative human beings that are out there. Uh -huh. Just given the nature of their crime and trying to understand the cognitive distortions that are so deep rooted that have been pervasive throughout most of their lives and how that plays into their behaviors and their decisions to then commit these crimes. Um, also, there's the piece, you know, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but the vast majority of offenders have been offended themselves. Yeah some point in their life yeah um, so there's that huge trauma piece that goes into it that was really interesting to me as well like how are there i can't imagine many clearer examples of how our experiences growing up lend to impact our behaviors as adults or just later in life mm -hmm. and how we go about thinking about certain things yeah, you're right. That that is a very dramatic uh, underscoring of that. Yeah. One of so, the things I found myself wondering, uh, you know, as yeah. I was thinking about this conversation, is the, uh, I mean, a, an offender, and particularly sexual offender, probably the only thing worse than a sexual offender is a murderer, I suppose. But in terms of our cultural judgments. We have very yep. strong taboos about sexual so, offenders. Interestingly, um, in jail and prisons, sexual offenders are seen as like the bottom of the totem pole, below yeah. murderers. Yeah. Um, oh. Especially if you get to uh, offenders that have violated children, yes. so pedophiles and things like that. Yeah. Um, they are, that's why they have to be typically housed separately because they are seen as below murderers. Yeah. And I think you were right. Our society definitely perpetuates that even outside of um, jails and prisons where they are viewed as these egregious human beings that there is no redemption for them. Right. They are monsters. They have no sense of morality. And there's no. There's no coming back. And that's how a lot of society views it. Right. So given that, and then given that, um, as you said, it tends to be a very manipulative population. Yeah. So here you are as a young, hopeful, <laughs> green bright eyed, bushy tailed. Bushy -tailed. <laughs> yeah, bright eyed, bushy tailed junior psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, probably planning to be very skilled in being empathic and yep. really listening to people at, at a deep level and so on. How mm -hmm. were you able to handle that within yourself? Were you able to find empathy within yourself? Did that seem like an important thing to be able to do or, did it, or would that have been considered a big mistake? I'm sure there are some people that would consider it to be a big mistake. Uh, I do not. I, I don't align with that. I think no matter who, it's important to strive to treat everyone with empathy. I mean, when I opened up my practice, one of the tenets or pillars, you will, is like treating everyone, regardless of your past, with dignity and respect. These individuals are no different. Uh, so to backtrack just for a second, I had that experience over the summer, but then as I'm sure you're familiar with doctoral programs, my last year, the fifth year of the program was a year long internship. So I got matched to a site 
in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, that works specifically with adolescent and adult sex offenders in both a residential and outpatient setting. So the youngest um, offender I worked with, I believe was 12. And then the oldest, yeah, there's, I think he was in his 80s, something like that. Um, and then after internship, I stayed there for postdoc, res like residency, essentially. Um, and that was like my past two years before I opened up this practice. So I mentioned all of that because where I was, you know, it was a constant struggle. There were certainly some people who had difficulty with empathy or empathizing with the population we worked with. Um, and it certainly is a difficult population to be empathetic towards. Um, the way I viewed it and how I kind of wrapped my head around that, I guess, is I don't think anyone wakes up one morning and says, you know what, I, or when they're younger, like, you know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a sexual offender. I don't right. think anyone has that thought um, when they wake up in the morning for the first time now, when they go, you know what I want to do today? I think I'm going to watch child pornography, or I think I'm going to go sexually offend someone. I think I'm going to go traumatize someone. No one starts off that way. It may get to that point, but something happens along the way. Well, particularly uh, if they have been offended, as you said earlier. Yeah. Um, if, if they it's, were it's raped all learned or physically behavior. violated or emotionally violated coming up. Yeah. So, you know, especially my work with the adolescents. So all of, all, all of them are on probation. Um, and if not all, almost all of them are on probation. And it ranges from fan, like they violated family members to strangers. And the severity also depends. Um, but none of them ever saw themselves here. No one ever believes that they are going to be in that situation. And I would say out of the adolescence, at least everyone I worked with personally, they all had a trauma history. Mm -hmm. Whether it was sexual or not, somewhere along their life, and it's a relatively short life we're talking about so far, but somewhere along their life, the adults mistreated them. The adults didn't teach them, didn't guide them appropriately. They learned somewhere that this is how you handle things appropriately. When someone upsets you, when you need to teach someone a lesson, this is what you do. Whether it's physical violence, verbal or sexual, um, that is what they grew up learning. Yeah. So it's easy from that lens, at least for myself, to really empathize with them and understand that this isn't the life that they deserved to have. They shouldn't have been treated that way. Now that doesn't excuse their behaviors. They need to be accountable for their own actions. But for the empathy, like understanding that this isn't where they want to be in life. Yeah, seeing uh, the human being in them. There. Yeah. yeah, and everyone has that piece of them. Yeah. Everyone is still someone's father, uh, child right someone everyone has family whether they talk to them or not whether they were mistreated or not and i think everyone tends to have at least i choose to believe everyone wants to have that ideal relationship you know whether they have it or not yeah we see in movies we see in shows and in news our friends whoever like those really nice warm loving relationships with friends and family and a lot of these individuals lack that and they've never experienced it mm -hmm. so i almost view work with them you know trying to provide a corrective emotional experience for them by demonstrating empathy for them because that may not be something that they've ever experienced before yeah it may actually be threatening in some ways for them, right? Yeah, they may not know what to do with it. They yeah. don't know how to handle someone being kind or understanding yeah. of them. 
it, it can, certainly can be a foreign experience for them. Um, a, a thought that uh, I'm, I'm going to jump back for just a moment, but yeah. I want to stay kind of with the emotional tone that we're with now, but uh, going back to where the money is in psychology, expert mm -hmm. witness, expert, expert witness, witness is where the big bucks are. <laughs> it certainly can be. Yeah. <laughs> now, probably not for the kinds of cases that we're talking about here, but in, in the corporate world, uh, big, yeah. big insurance company litigations and so on, mm -hmm. when psychologists are called upon to uh, be expert witnesses, they can command yeah. a lot of money. So, but I don't oh, yeah. know if that's what's motivating you and it's not the place I went, uh, but it's, it's- The money piece? No, I don't think it's ever, it's, and I've gotten into this discussion with a lot of, even just like family and friends where, a big decision I had to make with my practices taking insurance or not taking insurance. And the idea is if you take insurance, you're able to help more people yeah. uh, because more people will come through the door, but you may not live the same type of lifestyle if you are out of pocket. Um, so I had a lot of people say like, Oh, see, so you're only in it for the money because I made the decision I'm out of pocket. Um, I do accept a couple insurances, but that's a whole other thing. But um, I'm largely out of pocket now. And I would have people say like, see, you don't care about the people. You only care about the money, Adam. I'm like, no, it's just the reality of any situation is we're in a society that you need to make money to afford things to live for me to keep the lights on in my practice for me to sustain what I'm doing there there's a reality yeah. there yeah um, so with expert with like ex expert testimony there's a lot of prep work that goes into that you know it's not just sitting on a stand answering questions getting grilled by both sides it is hours of reading every single assessment that's been done all of the therapy notes it's knowing all of that inside and out Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's your client or someone you did an assessment on or not, understanding all of it, and then talking with the attorneys, coordinating all of that. Um, it's a lot of hours that are behind the scenes, much like oh, I'm sure yeah. making a podcast. A lot of stuff goes into it that most people don't get to see. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... So I imagine you got some of that insight from, was it an uncle that you mentioned who's the forensic psychiatrist? Yeah, he's a family friend, but I consider family him. Family friend, yeah. Yeah, I consider so him like an uncle. I learned a lot about the ins and outs of that from him, I would guess. Um, kind of, only how much time goes into it. Um, yeah, that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, there's a, just seeing how hard they worked at, what they were doing and how many hours went into it. It was, it demands a lot of respect. Um, and frankly, it, there's a lot of weight that goes with it. Um, one of the reasons I love doing the test, like testifying so much is because it's a great responsibility. And I truly, I feel privileged being able to be in this role when I am in that role advocating for either my client or an agency that I'm testifying on the behalf of um, to make sure that everyone involved is being treated fairly, whether or not that is exactly what my um, client wants. Like there are a lot of people I'm sure will, you know, you're paying me, I'll be on your side of things. Yeah. But for me, it's you're paying me because I'm good at what I do and I'm going to give you the honest, fair truth behind what my professional opinion, my clinical judgment tells me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's very commendable, I think. And uh, and uh, try to stay true to that <laughs> because there will be pressures. Right? Oh, there absolutely. And yeah, at the uh, during my internship and postdoc, 
one of the things I did, if it wasn't uh, working with sex offenders, we also worked with a local children youth agency. Um, so a lot of the work I did there, a lot of the assessments I did when it wasn't for juveniles for some sort of offense or criminal activity, it was doing assessments for the parents or on behalf of children and youth on the parents that had their kids taken away or were involved in some sort of abuse, whether they were the perpetrators or if they were the perpetrators by omission. It's like they didn't tell anyone that their partner was abusing. Mm -hmm. um, so in that, it was a lot of heavy work. And again, to underscore a lot of responsibility because in my recommendations, I'm discussing if they are capable or have the skills at that given time to appropriately care for and parent their own child. And if not, what should visitation look like? If not, should there be any visitation? And then I would also do treatment for those individuals providing summaries to be able to, you know, all right, well, they've made this much progress now, so why don't we bump up some visitation uh, and making those recommendations to the court. So that really uh, underscores what you said earlier about the weight of what you're doing, that that's, that's a lot of responsibility that was, uh, here you are again as a young guy who's making decisions probably for people that are older than you are, right, about yeah. what they can and cannot do with their children. Oh yeah, um, it was and look, something I've struggled with, and by str something that's been brought up to me several times from when I first started um, in training. I mean, my program, I loved it. Where our first year, second semester, we started seeing clients in the school's clinic, so very early on. Mm -hmm. And my first client I ever had, he was fifty some odd years old. I believe I was 22 or 23 at the time. He's like, I'm literally more than double your age. I have children older than you are. How are you supposed to help me? Yeah. And yeah. that hasn't stopped, especially in the work with children and youth. The first question, are you a parent? And I'm open with them. I'm like, no, I'm not a parent. I can't tell you what it's like to be a parent. And most of the time, the clients are women, the mothers. And I'll throw in there, I'm also not a mother. And I will never be a mother. Um, gets them to laugh a little bit. And I explain to them, I'm not trying to tell you what it's like to be a parent. I don't know what your life is like. But I can tell you how to get your kid to do the behaviors that you want them to do in an appropriate way. I can give you the skills to relax and to cope with the stressors that are inherent in being a parent, the frustrations that come along when your kid doesn't listen to you, the frustrations of being in a low socioeconomic um, area, all of those. There's no guidebook. I'm the closest thing that you're going to get to a manual and trying to get them to buy into what we're doing together in that way. Yeah. You said, I'm the closest you're going to get to being a what? Uh, the closest that they're going to have to like a manual of how to parent. A manual. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like there are books out there, but there's a book that will, if for one book that says this, there's another book that says that. Yeah. I spent five years in grad school, part of which was learning how to help get kids to listen and to teach appropriate behaviors and convey things in certain ways that not just the parents will understand, but children will understand. Um, it sounds like you've got pretty good preparation and that uh, you have a lot of confidence around the preparation that you got in school. Yeah, I'm very fortunate for my program. Um, it was a generalist model, which I really appreciated. They didn't try to pigeonhole you into, you have to do CBT, you have to be psychodynamic or this or that. They really let us find our own path and there was a professor that you know matched whatever that was whatever your uh, orientation was there was someone that you could talk to and consult with and get supervision from wow that's great that's great yeah. i would think that you might have some war stories without violating uh, 
confidentiality. Um, yeah. I wonder if you might have one that was uh, felt like a, a win, like a real success for you, and uh, one that was uh, not a win, but maybe um, just horrible or frustrating or yeah. whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say, so I'll start with the good, because why not? So one of the roles I did was I facilitated uh, group therapies for the adult sex offenders. Almost everyone in this group was court ordered to be there as part of their probation or parole. Um, most times, and they are in this group indefinitely for the, for the as long as they're on probation or parole, they are in this group getting treatment once a week. So when they enter this group, as you might imagine, it's a pretty jarring experience. All of a sudden they're told, hey, these are the rules of group. These are the expectations. And they're very limiting at first. Um, and it's for the safety of the community. And we tell them, you know, you earn these privileges back as you're in group, as you demonstrate, as you pass polygraphs, all this stuff. Um, everyone has a really visceral reaction to it when they first get to group. So there's this one guy who came in and one of the most entitled individuals that I experienced in these groups. Um, he had been in group, then got had gotten kicked out and then came back to group and just through straight processing of everything that was going on in his own cognitive distortions he really grabbed onto and bought into the program and the idea and trusted the myself and my co-facilitator at the time that what we were doing was going to help him if he just like trusted the process with us and seeing the turn he made was amazing i mean we had them um, they submitted things called safety plans and it was essentially an outline if they wanted to go do some sort of extra kind of extracurricular um activity out in the community so a lot of them are family they have families they want to go around the holidays go see a light show go to fireworks they want to go to thanksgiving dinner at their whoever house so they had to fill out this form to identify risk factors and all of like who was going to be there, what they were going to do, if they encountered their risks, all of that stuff. Um, this particular individual, he became, he would just spit out these safety plans and they were some of the most comprehensive things to really demonstrate that, that he understood the risks that were inherent in him being out in the community and how not just him, but other people in the community might respond to him. Um, and we try to tell these guys, it's not just about you. It's making sure you're safe as well. Mm -hmm. It's not about always protecting the community. It's also protecting you because all it's going to take is one person to make one accusation. And who are they going to believe, whether it's true or not? Their registered sex offender or the civilian with no record. Uh huh. It's going to be the civilian. Yeah. And you that's said this the guy when he came into the group was very entitled. Uh, very. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you mean? How did that manifest itself? I shouldn't have to put in safety plans. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to act on these behaviors again. It was a mistake. I learned my lesson. My family doesn't think I should have to do this. It's not fair to them. You are just punishing me. Uh, all of all of that yeah and then also so this individual was or is married um and some of the entitlement had played out sexually as well like i should be able to have sex with my wife um despite her not being comfortable with it um but that entitlement like we're married i should be able to i should be able to you know x y and z so going from that to a deeper understanding of why that stuff is inappropriate, what consent actually looks like and sounds like, and why he shouldn't just be allowed to have sex with his wife just because they're married, 
especially given everything that he has put that family through and how he might have traumatized his family and caused a lot of stress in his family circle. Um, so seeing him make the turn on that yeah. was amazing, not just for his own well-being, but also watching his family life improve dramatically as well as a result of his own growth. Wow. So that's got to be very reinforcing. Amazing. And then honestly, like, so when I left the company, one of the things we do whenever a facilitator leaves group, everyone goes around. It's like typically 12 people in the group. Uh -huh. um, so everyone goes around, like says their goodbyes. And then the facilitator will like say goodbye to everyone. And one of the most rewarding things for me was hearing each group members, especially this individual's encouragement for me, how they would talk about horror stories from the past and how the company has changed so much for the better. But a big part of that that they felt was, you know, me coming in with empathy and me treating them like humans and treating them with the respect and dignity that unfortunately they weren't used to uh, from yeah. <laughs> well and it's it was very reinforcing for me because sure. a lot of the times when you go against the grain anywhere especially in a company where you know you you advocate for these guys and you have coworkers or just other people in the community just kind of look at you like why why like why are you going this extra mile for these people it's like why not like they're doing what they have to do they serve their time they're on probation they're coming to group they they haven't done anything to show me that i shouldn't be doing this for them yeah yeah now that would bring me to like the negative yeah example right. <laughs> the more story i'm wondering about um, that tied to right so sometimes people don't adjust very well to group um there was, and again, like I mentioned, they are some of the most manipulative people. So I'm imperfect. Sometimes I fall for it. So there was this one individual who it was, he was not adjusting well, um, very defiant, very entitled. I shouldn't have to do that. I'm not a risk to the community, all of the same stuff. Um, he wanted to be in unhealthy relationships, everything. So one day just, he came in, he's like, I had this epiphany and we are asking him about it. And he had this experience with an ex of his and it supposedly like light bulb moment. Yeah. And from that moment on, he became like, he was saying all the right things and he had really good insight for other group members not just himself uh, and this was long standing for weeks so he slowly earned back privileges um we were talking to his probation officer weekly saying like hey like he with pause you know with a grain of salt like he's doing really well right now and then he was looking for a job we allowed him to you know be approved for whatever job um it was at a local not a fast food chain like um like a bagel shop and come to find out that he was violating probation by committing sexual uh deviant acts while at work so he was taking videos of uh customers like upskirt videos he was zooming in on the breasts of underage customers, underage coworkers, and then coming into work or coming into group and not like obviously disclosing any of this. So we found out, thankfully, almost coincidentally, someone that was part of the police department who knew he was on probation asked like, hey, where is this guy? And they said, oh, he got fired because and I was like, do you mind me asking why they told him you know some creepy things had been going on this that the yeah. third um he had told us in group like he got fired just because of differences in scheduling and he just didn't get along with some of his co-workers so he thought it best if he just 
find a different place of employment. Mm-hmm. Which you're like, okay, good insight. Sure, go find another job. Yeah. Uh, so we find this out and instantly we're like, well, we just got the wool pulled over our eyes. Yeah. Um, you know, myself, the co-facilitator, all the other group members, my supervisor, all of us who were just like aghast. At, like you'd been played. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we invest a lot of trust and we'll go to bat for people. And then when this type of thing happened, it reminds us why people have such a hard time trusting this yeah. population. Yeah. Um, so consequently, I mean, he was very promptly removed from the program and, you know, whatever happened with probation happened. Yeah. Um, but that was a really disheartening example yeah, for sure. myself and the co-facilitator where you know, we really thought we had gotten through to this individual. Um, but, you know, we take solace in the fact that we are imperfect. We are humans. We're fallible. Um, and there isn't anything we can do if someone chooses to behave in that sort of way. It doesn't speak anything to us necessarily, but more so to their character and the choices that they make in betraying and manipulating someone that is trying to offer them help. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I wonder if you have any advice for other young people who are entering the profession, either recent graduates such as yourself or people who are in the process in graduate school, if you have any advice for them or if there were things that you would have liked to have known that you didn't know. Yeah. Um, I've told a few people this analogy. You know, I think it's pretty common. A lot of people will say like high school doesn't prepare you for real life. You know, they don't teach you about taxes or money management or um, all of that stuff, but they teach you a lot of skills that you do need, like a lot of knowledge. I believe grad school at least for my degree, set us up in a lot of the same ways. It taught us a lot of very important knowledge, like a very, very strong foundation. But no one prepared us for life after grad school. Um, I didn't know what the EPPP was until my internship year. What the what was? I I don't Uh, know if I know either. (laughs) The the EPPP is the, uh, I'm going to butcher the actual acronym, but it's the National Licensing Examination. Ah, okay. So it's this four hour multiple choice exam that is intense. You have to learn literally everything about psychology. Yeah. Um, even things that you're never going to use, like industrial organizational psychology. Right. I'm not an IO psych. I. I don't need to know about like the four fifths rule and how that, you know, what the implications are for that and choosing who you hire, um, but how to learn it all. No one prepares you for that. No one talks about that, at least from my experiences. Um, I don't know if it's like this hush hush thing, but that's a reality. I never knew what like an NPI number was, a national provider number. Like, how to even apply for it. I didn't know how to get paneled with insurance companies. I didn't know how to set rates because no one talked about opening a private practice because no one saw that as like a viable route. Everyone kind of like, you're going to go work for an agency and you know, you might, you'll probably be salaried and this and that. Um, Business insurance, how to choose a location of a practice, the name of your practice. Like my last name is awful. No one can say my last name. (laughs) So I had to make the very conscious decision. Like I'm not going to use my name in for my practice because no one can spell it. No one's going to remember it. Um, No one's going to remember how to spell it or say it. So all these are just like little things that no one talks about or no one prompts people to think about. And I would, I wish someone had offered that type of 
um, thought experiment almost. Like, all right, let's say like you want to do this. What are some of the things you should know about? Um, it's, it's really been a lot of learning as you go. Yeah, there might be a side business for you there offering I've, workshops that cover one, all that stuff. One of the things I am very passionate about is I really do want to help a lot of, as many students as I can that are going through PsyD programs or master level programs. Um, I want to teach them these things. I've reached out to local universities to offer these. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of ego in our field. A lot of what? Uh, ego. Ego, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it's hard for a program to admit that there's like a shortcoming. Uh -huh. And people don't want to necessarily hear like what they're not telling their students, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, they, they don't prepare you to be a small business person, which is what you have to be, right? Yeah. Um, you know, even things like what it's like talking about money. We are by nature empathic people. And whether it's a copay or a full out of pocket fee, having those conversations about money is really awkward and difficult sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and setting those boundaries. Right. So, even how do you talk about that? How do you assert yourself appropriately in those situations? Um, you know, I wish there were, there was more information about that. Uh, you know, I hope when my practice continues to grow, I'm looking forward to the day I'm able to offer my practice as like a practicum site, because I want to offer that opportunity for people who might be interested in private practice. Like, what is that actually like? Because there are so many pros and there are some cons to it. Like, if I don't work, I don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> but I also get to make my own schedule. Um, and I have a very close relationship, like for all the scheduling and all of that stuff. Um, you know, I enjoy that aspect of it all. But it's a lot harder than, or presents different challenges, I should say, than going into a nine to five at some agency that is going to say like, all right, well, like, you're seeing this many clients today. Oh, this person canceled. That person canceled. This is a new client. This is your assessment for the day. Wow. You know, when I wear every hat, I'm my biller. I'm my scheduler. I'm the therapist. Like I do everything. Um, and right now I wouldn't have it any other way. It's the best way to learn this side of things, in my opinion, just doing it all and putting in the hours to get it all done. Yeah. You know, the American Psychological Association, I think, does uh, strive these days to provide some of those things and to have workshops and they do so on. So, yeah, I don't know if you're taking advantage of that. Uh, have, have you joined the American Psychological Association? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm in the uh, APA and PPA, which is Pennsylvania's Psychological Association. And there is a wealth of knowledge. I know the APA has a division for early career psychologists that oh, really? offer a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and it offers a lot of templates and things like that. Um, and that was another thing, like even just, you know, forming an LLC. Like, what is that? How do you do that? Who do you talk to? Yeah. Um, choosing the electronic record keeping software yeah. you want to use. Exactly. So like all of these are decisions and learning the ins and outs of everything. Yeah. Um, I understand why people hesitate to go into private practice, but I wish, you know, for anyone interested in it, it's one of the most rewarding things, even just like learning it all and growing the business organically. Um, and there's... you're growing in the process that you, as you're growing oh, yeah. your business, you're growing because you're learning new mm -hmm. skills and uh, yeah, so yeah. far the biggest barrier I've had. Um, and thankfully it hasn't even been too much of a problem, but like, again, my age, like, I don't look like I'll, I'll, I'm 29. I know I look fairly young. I can't grow a beard for the life of me. <laughs> really? um, Oh, it's, yeah, it's not good. I grew so, up right away. <laughs> I wish I could. I, you know, I thought of it all. Um, 
so that's been a challenge, like getting the respect and getting myself in the door with people, um, which is like a fantastic thing about emails and phones. They can't, you know, nobody you knows that way. dog on the internet. There's a famous uh, New Yorker cartoon where one dog is remarking to the other at, at his keyboard. Nobody knows yeah. your dog on the web. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, but and you're right. I mean, it's been a very huge learning experience and growing experience for myself as well. Yeah. One that's been fantastic to be experiencing. And I'm sure I'm missing like 70% of what I'm actually learning. And in hindsight, I'll be able to look back and say like, oh, that's okay. That was something that I actually picked up or I learned yeah. through that process. Yeah. Well, I'm very impressed by you, and um, you know, I think you're you've got a lot that you're starting off with a, a lot of uh, a lot of confidence and competence, capability, uh, personability. So I have no doubt that you're going to be very successful. Uh, I appreciate keep, that. Keep me in the loop and let me know how your career advances and. As we wind down, I wonder if uh, there are any last thoughts that you have or uh, or maybe you'd like to let people know how they can uh, follow you. Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Thank you. Um, you know, like we were just mentioning, I, I'm a big fan of public speaking. I know I'm an anomaly in that way, but for anyone that's just, whether you just need some consultation, if you're a student that just wants to like talk about like what it's actually like to be in private practice, um, literally anything. I love hearing from people and having people reach out to me. Um, my website, it's very simple, ally psych, a l l y p s y c h dot com. Um, contact me on that. It has my phone number, has my email, all of that. Reach out there. Um, and I'm happy to connect with anyone about any number of topics that you're interested in. Okay, well, Adam Asoyan, Dr. Adam, Dr. Adam Asoyan, thanks so much for being my guest on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you for having me. It's been a privilege.